Now, the next thing that Hebrew says here is fascinating is, it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey. Now, that's the part of the line, especially when it's read in the lectionary, read in the liturgy, that I know strikes most people as problematic. Uh, because for Hebrews to say that Jesus was made perfect, makes it sound like it's implying that he was imperfect, right? That there was some flaw or some fault or some imperfection about him that was corrected somehow through his passion. So is that what the letter of the Hebrews is saying? Well, you can probably detect from my tone that the answer is no. But how would you explain that? So let me, let me try to say what being made perfect does not mean and then what it does mean as well, to try to clarify. Okay, so the first thing that we want to say here is that when the letter of the Hebrews says that Jesus was made perfect, it does not mean that he was a sinner or that he had any fault or imperfection. And you can know that by going back a few chapters in Hebrews itself, because of all the letters in the New Testament, Hebrews is the most explicit about the fact that Jesus has no sin, right? So in Hebrews chapter 4, Verse 15, he says, quote, For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay, so Hebrews is very, very clear about the fullness of Jesus' humanity, right? It is a full human nature. He does have limitations, he does have weaknesses, the most obvious being that he can suffer but there's no sin. He can even experience external temptation, like all human beings do, but without sinning. So Hebrews is very clear about the sinlessness of Jesus. So that's not what we're talking about here when it says that he was made perfect or that he learned obedience through what he suffered. So what are we talking about? Well, this is a fascinating example of why knowing Greek is very helpful. Um, and in this case, the Greek word for being made perfect or to perfect, teleo, is a word that has a wide range of meanings. Um, and in order to determine the meaning, you have to look at the context, okay? So um, in this case, it's very fascinating that if you go back to the Greek translation of the Jewish scriptures known as the Septuagint, one of the most prominent uses for the word teleo, to make perfect, is not, as we, we commonly think of it, to be made flawless. Although it, could, it can be used that way. It can be made, perfect can mean complete, whole, without flaw. It can mean all those things. But one specific meaning that it has in Jewish scripture is to be ordained a priest. It's the word for ordination. On the day of a priest's ordination, they are perfected, consecrated, right, to God and to his service. So, for example, um, let me just show you here. In the uh, Le book of Leviticus, chapter 8, verse 31 through 33, in the Greek Septuagint, this is a parallel, Moses is giving instructions to Aaron and his sons for how they will be ordained. So, if you've ever been to a priestly ordination today, if you've ever been to the liturgy of a priest ordination, you'll know it's a pretty elaborate ceremony. There's lots of symbols and rites involved. It's pretty momentous and solemn and fascinating. It's just beautiful, beautiful ceremony. Well, Leviticus 8, if you were wondering, is what the ordination service of an Old Testament priest looked like. So if you want to go back and see the details of it, you can read the whole chapter. But in that chapter, in the Greek translation, verse 31 and 33, this is what it says, quote, Moses spoke to Aaron and his sons, you shall not go out of the entrance of the tent of testimony for seven days until the time of your fulfillment, literally, until the day of your perfection, hemera teleosesis, is fulfilled. For he will complete your ordination in seven days. And the word there for ordination literally is the perfection of your hands. Teleose taskeras humon in seven days. That's Leviticus 8, 31 to 33, Greek chapter 2. So notice in that passage in Leviticus 8, the Greek word teleo, perfect, is used both to describe the day of ordination 
and the act of ordination. Um, the day of ordination is called the day of your perfection, being made complete, right? And then the act of ordination is called the perfection of your hands. Now, it's not clear exactly what that means. Even in the original Hebrew, um, the term that would be used to describe a priest's ordination is sometimes the filling of his hands. You can see how that would become the completion of his hands. And we don't know exactly what that entailed. It um, seems to have been a way of expressing that the priest was given the sacrifice, the ordination sacrifice. To His hands were filled probably with the um, bread offering, known as the mincha, or one of the sacrificial offerings. And then, then he would offer that up to God, right, in his first act of priestly sacrificial offering. Whatever that expression means, the point is that the word teleo, to be made perfect, is the Greek word for the ordination of a priest in the Jewish scripture and in the book of Leviticus and Exodus. Okay, So, when Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, which by the way, is all about the priesthood. I mean, like if you read Hebrews from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 13, the central theme of the book and the vast majority of the book in terms of its topics throughout the chapters is about the priesthood of Jesus Christ. So when you see the word teleo in a book that's almost entirely about the priesthood, in a first century Jewish context, the natural reading would be that it's referring to the ordination of Jesus consecration of Jesus, his act of priestly sacrificial offering as a priest, as the true priest of the new and eternal covenant. So, when Hebrews 5 says, being made perfect, Jesus became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, it's talking about his perfection as a priest. It's not talking about the elimination of some sin or some flaw from him. And it's really unfortunate in this case that the lectionary stops in verse 9. Because if you have any doubts about what I'm suggesting to you, you can just read the next verse. Because in chapter, in verse 10, Hebrews 5 verse 10, which isn't in the lectionary but is in Hebrews, um, it actually repeats the line and makes explicit reference to the priesthood. So I'll read the full text now and you'll hear what I mean. So I'll go back to verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being perfected, think here, being ordained, being consecrated a priest, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this is a classic example of what happens in Hebrew poetry. It's called synonymous parallelism, or where you'll take two verses of the poem and they'll say the same thing in two different ways, right? It's two ways of saying the same thing. Being perfected and becoming a source of salvation for all is the same thing as being designated a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. Does that make sense? So you see the verbal parallelism there? So to be perfected and to be designated priest are two ways of saying the same thing, which is exactly the case in the book of Leviticus, chapter 8. So in closing then, what Hebrews is doing, and this is very important on the fifth Sunday of Lent as we head toward the celebration of Palm Sunday and the Paschal mystery of Jesus' passion and death, is to remind us that the crucifixion of Jesus isn't just an execution. That's what it would have looked like to anyone who saw it. We got a Jewish non-citizen being sentenced to death by capital punishment, by hanging and asphyxiation. It just looks like a Roman execution. But through the eyes of faith, the letter of the Hebrews is revealing to us that what looks like an execution is actually an ordination. It's the perfection of Jesus' day where he will offer as a sacrifice not the blood of bulls or goats or lambs or even the unleavened bread of the mincha in the Old Testament, but he will offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of all. So the crucifixion isn't just an execution, it's a sacrifice. It's a priestly sacrifice of a man who was not a priest according to the order of Levi, but high priest according to the order of Melchizedek.